The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. How do we think about limits with reference to religious freedom? I think that we need to think about that in, in very carefully. It's not just about asking majorities whether they think that the minority should have their rights limited. Um, it's about whether there is a broad-based sense uh, that whatever limit we're thinking about is understandable and justifiable and legitimate. There is a tendency in Malaysia to use public order justification to prevent public disorder or, uh, if you view it in another way, to placate concerns of certain sections of the community who might feel offended or uneasy with the existence or the activities of religious minorities or with religious conversions. In this episode, who decides who's Muslim in modern Islamic states? Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. Although freedom of religion and belief is often taken for granted in liberal democracies, it's by no means universally available. Yet it was not uncommon for nation-states created in the wake of 20th century decolonisation to include freedom of worship in their newly minted constitutions – And among those were Pakistan and Malaysia, both with Islam enshrined as their official religion. As former British colonies, both nations adopted British common law as the basis of their respective civil legal systems. Yet their Muslim-majority populations are also governed by their own systems of Islamic jurisprudence. Islam, like other forms of organised religion, is not particularly ecumenical in its outlook – So how do these nations reconcile the doctrinal dictates of their state religion with an individual's right to choose their religion or belief system? How do these two seemingly parallel legal systems, common law and sharia, operate when it comes to matters of Muslim identity? And how do political factors play into deciding who can or even must be in the ummah or community, even if against their will? Joining me on Ear to Asia to peel back the layers of the proverbial onion, a South Asia political scientist, Dr. Matthew Nelson from Asia Institute, and specialist in Malaysian law, Dr. Diane Shah from the National University of Singapore's Law School. Welcome to the program, Diane and Matthew. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Can we start with a bit of context around how religious freedoms are viewed in Malaysia and Pakistan, both former British colonies, as we said? How did that influence how freedom of worship sits in their constitutions and legal frameworks? Matthew, if I can ask you first about Pakistan. Sure. So in Pakistan, um, like a lot of countries, uh, you will see a section of the constitution that's devoted to fundamental rights. There's a specific chapter and it's called the fundamental rights chapter. Um, And so within that chapter, there are several different rights and one of them will be uh, religious freedom. And the particular phrasing of the religious freedom clause looks a lot like um, the religious freedom clauses that you'll see in other states. So in, in the Pakistan case, it's pretty interesting that that part of their constitution uh, was actually lifted very closely from the Indian experience. And if you look then at the Indian experience and where they got their particular clause on religious freedom, you notice that they're borrowing a lot of their language from, from the Irish constitution. And so there's a lot of sort of international similarity in the religious freedom clauses that sit within the fundamental rights chapters of these different constitutions. So some people are surprised to find that these clauses uh, in a place like Pakistan um, already look pretty familiar. They look familiar, but not necessarily in the context of British law. That's right. So this is something that I think surprises a number of people. Um, When we look at fundamental rights in parliamentary democracies, there's this tension or a, a challenging balance between, on the one hand, parliamentary sovereignty, and on the other hand, fundamental rights. Um, And in the British tradition, um, parliamentary sovereignty really takes pole position there. So fundamental rights, as we would see it in other constitutions, where there are explicit and enumerated and enforceable rights, um, that's not been part of the British constitutional tradition, which itself is somewhat unusual because it's not an explicitly written constitution. 
So in the British experience, um, really until the European Human Rights Act came into to British law in the late 1990s, you really saw a pattern in which fundamental rights were treated uh, really as a matter of tradition. But if Parliament needed to make particular laws or adjustments that we might see as encroaching on fundamental rights, uh, well, then the parliamentary sovereignty preference would sort of kick in. And that would be the go-to sort of principle. Whereas in these other countries, they're not necessarily following the British example there. What they're doing instead is making the fundamental rights explicit, enumerated, and enforceable right there in the Constitution, which is quite different from what the, the British experience itself has been. And Matthew, what was the, uh, I suppose, the reasoning behind the determination to have freedom of religion enshrined as a constitution, especially against the backdrop of Pakistan as one of the world's first states explicitly created on the basis of a religious identity? What, what was the impetus for freedom of worship to be a constitutional right? Yeah, in fact, Pakistan was the first uh, state in the world to be created and, and established and then constitutionalized um, with reference to a particular religious community. And when uh, the Pakistani community, if you will, was designing their constitution, uh, they were really trying to balance two different dimensions of, of their identity. On the one hand, the Islamic perspective, and the other hand, um, sort of what they called the Islamic democratic perspective. And, and keep in mind that Pakistan was divided from India in 1947, and there were still many non-Muslims in the territory that became Pakistan, just as there are uh, still today many Muslims in the Hindu-majority uh, territory that we know as India. And so when they're writing their constitutions, uh, one of the things that they were working on is really a balance between the overall sort of Muslim identity of the new state, but also a recognition uh, that they have many citizens from many different religious traditions, and those citizens would also have rights. And so there's a famous speech, actually, from sort of the founding father of Pakistan, Jinnah, in his first speech before parliament. He sort of goes on at length to say that although um, we are a Muslim-majority state, all people, whether they're going to a mosque or a church or a temple, will have their rights. And Diane, if we if we look at Malaysia, which first became independent after Pakistan, is it a, a similar story about the development of the constitution and the enshrinement of freedom of worship? It's similar in the sense that the language used in the Bill of Rights in the Federal Constitution of Malaysia uh, is actually lifted from the Indian Constitution. So there's a, a transplant, if you could call it that. However, in the pre-independence constitution-making process in which there was a committee set up by the British government uh, consisting of five jurists who were foreigners and they were experts in law, um, this committee worked with local leaders to figure out or draft a constitution for Malaysia. Now, it was agreed that a Bill of Rights would be included in the constitution of the soon to be independent country. But this happened after some resistance from the local leaders. So the local leaders at that time thought that if a Bill of Rights were to be included in the constitution, that could hamper government expediency and government decision-making processes. But in the end, after all that, they decided to include a Bill of Rights in the constitution. And that Bill of Rights includes uh, the freedom of religion, which encompasses freedom of worship, the freedom to profess and practice and propagate any religion, and the freedom to establish and maintain uh, religious institutions. So in terms of the constitution itself, uh, freedom of religion is protected in Article 11 of the constitution. But even in Article 3 of the constitution, which recognizes Islam as the uh, religion of the federation or the religion of the state, uh, there is an implicit and explicit guarantee of freedom of religion there. So in Article 3, for instance, it says that Islam is the religion of the Federation, but other religions may be practiced in peace and harmony. And then there's another subclause in Article 3, which says that the recognition of Islam does not derogate from other provisions in the Constitution. And essentially, in short, that means that even as the Constitution recognizes Islam as the state religion, that does not trump other provisions in the Constitution, including the protection of fundamental liberties. 
So, Deanne, in Malaysia, you've got the fundamental rights as laid out in the constitution, you've got a parliamentary system, and you've got Islam as the religion of the federation. How do the various elements fit and work together? Of course, there are limits to freedom of religion. Uh, And in particular, freedom of religion may be limited on the grounds of public order, public health, and so on. There's nothing new here because it comports largely with provisions that you find in international documents. But in Malaysia's case, when we think about the influence or the position of Islam in the constitution, there's also another clause in the freedom of religion provision, which allows uh, an additional unique limitation. And this is where the constitution allows individual state legislatures to enact laws to restrict or control the propagation of other religions among Muslims. Now, it is important to note that this captures both intra-Islam propagation as well as inter-religious propagation. So there are state laws, for instance, that criminalize uh, acts by Muslims in contempt of lawful official religious authority. So put simply, Muslims may be prosecuted under these state laws for contradicting a fatwa issued by a mufti or a state or national fatwa council, even though in Islamic jurisprudence, fatwas are merely legal opinions. So do those state laws, do they sit alongside the civil legal system and do do Sharia courts uh, come into play, I guess, at all levels of the legal system? Yes, the state laws operate alongside the civil uh, legal system and the Sharia courts have the authority or jurisdiction to enforce this uh, Islamic state laws. And I want to look in a minute both at the issue of limits to freedom in the name of public order, but also the issues that are essentially, you know, what that crossover is between Sharia and civil systems. But if I can ask you, Matthew, about Pakistan, how do the various moving parts fit together in in the Pakistani context? Yeah, so in Pakistan, uh, again, you have these three elements. On the one hand, fundamental rights. And then next to that, you have a parliamentary system. And then next to that, you have these Islamic dimensions. And all three could exist in tension. But somehow in the Constitution, they try to uh, find some way of working together. So in lots of places, you will see, if you will, the tension between fundamental rights and parliament working out in a way that allows the Supreme Court to decide when a parliamentary law, for instance, might infringe on a fundamental right. And so if this piece of legislation is said to restrict a fundamental right in a particular way, someone can file a case and it will arrive in the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will decide what that boundary is so that the fundamental right is preserved and and the legislation needs to be amended. On the other side, however, we have this relationship between parliament and Islam. Uh, And in the Pakistani case, There was a controversy about exactly how to ensure that the laws made by parliament, this legislation, would be compatible with the idea of Islamic injunctions. And and initially, um, when they were writing the constitution, some proposed that there should be what they called a mullah board, which is sort of like a, a council of clerics that would decide whether the laws made by parliament were Islamic enough. A little bit like you might see in Iran today, where there are clerics who actually have supervisory powers. But that idea of the mullah board was rejected. Uh, And in the end, what they came up with was something called uh, the Council of Islamic Ideology, uh, which is an advisory board. And basically, it can offer advice to the parliament. And so it can say, it looks like the legislation you've proposed might be contrary to the Islamic injunctions, but ultimately the decision-making power was to lie with the parliament. This is one of the ways they tried to put these different elements together. So fundamental rights would always be protected by the Supreme Court. The parliament would be subject to its decisions. But when it came to Islam, the advisory power of this Council of Islamic Ideology left the, the parliament in the driver's seat, ultimately. So hopefully that gives you a sense of how they tried to fit some of these pieces together through particular institutions that would have decision-making power. And in a practical sense in Pakistan, how does uh, Islamic jurisprudence sit alongside the civil court system? Is it like Malaysia where they essentially run in parallel? 
it's a little bit different. Uh, so as Dion said, in Malaysia, you have this hierarchy of Sharia courts that, that work within the states, the different divisions of Malaysia as a federal system. Uh, well, Pakistan is also a federal system. There are different provinces in Pakistan. But in Pakistan, the federal Sharia court is only present at the national level. You don't have a hierarchy of Sharia courts sitting alongside or parallel to civil courts in each province which you might see in in Malaysia. Instead, each province, if you will, in Pakistan, just has its ordinary hierarchy of civil courts. And then, if you will, at the high level, uh, you might bump into this institution, which was introduced in the 1980s, called the Federal Sharia Court. And the Federal Sharia Court, really its role is to take a slightly more active role uh, in judging whether legislation is Islamic or not. So initially you had this Council of Islamic Ideology, which was advisory. Um, But in the 1980s, they sort of stepped that up a little bit um, by introducing this federal Sharia court, which could be a little more active in actually judging whether um, particular pieces of legislation were Islamic or, as they say, un-Islamic. And so that's the only place where you would have, if you will, a parallel Sharia court at the federal level. So given that... How are the civil courts used on issues that go to the heart of freedom of religion and worship? That, I think, is probably the most interesting question. We have this impression, I think, that, you know, when it comes to matters Islamic, um, there will be a Sharia court that will decide these issues. Um, But in the Pakistani case, um, most of the, if you will, religious issues like blasphemy or heresy or um, apostasy or these types of things, these are investigated and decided by ordinary common law courts. And they refer to common law principles like public order or uh, the executive discretion of the state or whether the administrative offices of the state have acted in a reasonable way. And, And these notions, public order, executive discretion, reasonable administrative action, these are um, common law legal principles that we bump into in lots of countries. And so I think one of the things that it is very helpful to understand is that if there's an issue of blasphemy, for instance, and this is a very uh, sensitive and and important issue in Pakistan, the case will not necessarily jump into a Sharia court to be decided. Instead, it will come up in a criminal court, an ordinary criminal court, and, and it will be judged with reference to things like the notion that whatever is considered blasphemous is so provocative uh, that it might actually create a public order risk. Uh, that the the community will be so outraged that they might actually pour into the streets and generate some form of public disorder. And so this this risk, this public order risk, is the legal hook upon which the the case of blasphemy could be decided uh, without any reference to to Sharia principles. Uh, And I think people sometimes suspect that, you know, these Islamic issues are decided by Islamic law. And and I think it's useful to, to correct some of that. Deanne, in Malaysia, what sort of issues sit at that nexus of the civil and the Sharia systems? And is it clearly defined? Is it really obvious where various cases would go? Before I get into that, Ali, since we're talking about similarities and differences between Malaysia and Pakistan, I think I should highlight the similarity here, which is really interesting that, you know, we have these two countries where Islam uh, is the state religion. However, in Pakistan, whereas you have this, what is called the repugnancy clause, which says essentially that all existing laws shall be brought into conformity with the injunctions of Islam based on the Holy Quran and Sunnah and all that, you don't have such arrangements in Malaysia. In fact, when Article 3 on Islam was promulgated in the constitution-making process, the intention there was for this to be largely of a ceremonial role for Islam. Uh, And indeed, we have a judgment from the 1980s by the then Supreme Court in Malaysia saying that, yes, Islam is the state religion, but it does not make Malaysia a theocratic state. The laws in this country are secular laws, but Islamic laws only operate in a specific or limited sphere of law. And that brings me to your uh, question Ali. Well, the Sharia jurisdiction has authority only in a limited area of law. 
And largely, these are personal law matters relating to family issues, marriage, divorce, custody, and so on, and only for Muslims. And other issues such as the setting up of Islamic charitable trusts, these are, of course, within the Sharia jurisdiction, and that is spelled out in the Constitution. And this would be the issues that would be regulated by individual state legislatures. But there is also another category, and this is where it gets a bit more complex, more complex and probably often uneasy relationship between the constitutional recognition of Islam, Sharia's limited jurisdictional autonomy, and the secular issue of fundamental rights, right? So this is uh, the what I call the offenses against the precepts of Islam, and that is spelled out in the Constitution as an issue or an area of law that state legislatures could regulate for the jurisdiction of the Sharia courts. Now, such offenses potentially sit at the nexus of the civil and Sharia system. So, for instance, robbery and theft, these are technically offenses against the precepts of Islam, but they also fall under the federal jurisdiction and they are regulated by the penal code. So, under the arrangement in the Constitution, whatever that is explicitly listed as falling within the jurisdiction of the federal legislature, this cannot be regulated by the states under Islamic law. Um, However, something that is a little more complex is apostasy. Now, apostasy is seen, of course, by Islamic authorities and Muslims as an offense against the precepts of Islam. This is, of course, is renouncing Islam. Yes, renouncing Islam. But fundamentally, renouncing Islam or religious conversion is an issue concerning freedom of religion. And therefore, it raises a constitutional issue that, in my opinion, ought to be addressed by the civil courts or the civil jurisdiction. I know that there is a very specific case that we need to look at, and we will get to that in just a minute, that talks a little more and explains a little more about the, I suppose, the complexities around religious conversion. But Matthew, if I can talk about a very specific issue in Pakistan, and that is the Amadi, and how significant they have been to how Pakistan has defined religious freedom. Yeah, the Amadi are a, a very important group to consider. Just to give you a, some, some background here, the, the Ahmadi are a group that emerged at the end of the 19th century in a part of South Asia known as Punjab. And basically, there was a, a man named Ghulam Ahmed who was um, perceived himself and perceived uh, his role as that of a uh, reformer, someone who's going to revitalize uh, Islam in, in South Asia. And in the context of his activity, he also claimed that he was receiving inspiration, even revelations from God. As such, there were claims that he saw himself as a prophet, if you will, a latter-day prophet. And this uh, raised eyebrows in the broader Muslim community because there is a a verse in the Quran which says that the prophet Muhammad is the seal of prophecy itself. In other words, the last prophet. And so Ghulam Ahmed, who claimed to be a later prophet, and those who followed Ghulam Ahmed and his ideas were seen as uh, not least heterodox, but perhaps heretics. And their uh, particular status within the Muslim community was a source of controversy. Are they Muslim? Are they not Muslim? And so on. And so when you see the uh, the formation of Pakistan as a state for the South Asian Muslims, there immediately arises during the writing of the Constitution, for instance, a number of questions about who should lead the state, for instance. And they, the idea was that the head of the state should be a Muslim. Okay. And as soon as you have laws saying that the head of the state should be a Muslim, there's a follow-on question, which is, who counts as a Muslim? And really, there's a a historical curiosity here, which is that the leaders of the Pakistan movement to create Pakistan were largely secular Muslims. And many of the religious Muslim leaders in in South Asia uh, were initially skeptical of this Pakistan movement because they said, on the one hand, it looks like a movement for Muslims. And on the other hand, it seeks to create a secular Muslim majority state. And some of the religious leaders said, if at all we're going to have a a Muslim-majority state, it should not be a secular Muslim-majority state, it should be an Islamic state. And so they did not 
curiously, uh, support the, the push for the creation of Pakistan. But after it was created in 1947, uh, some of these leaders actually moved to Pakistan to say, well, now that Pakistan exists, let's ensure that it is not merely a secular Muslim majority state, but an Islamic state. And they saw themselves as leaders in pushing for that. And the way they did that is related to the Ahmadis. Basically, they said that we need to help, these religious leaders said, we need to help consolidate the identity of the Pakistani state, and we need to consolidate its Islamic identity. In order to do that, we need to more clearly define what this means, who is and who isn't a Muslim in in Pakistan, who counts as a member of the community and who counts as being on the periphery of this community. And they basically drew attention to the Ahmadi community to draw that boundary and say, all those who call themselves Muslims and identify Muhammad as the last prophet will count as Muslims. Those who call themselves Muslims but do not necessarily um, have that view um, will fall outside the boundary. And so the Ahmadis, if you will, became a group that played an instrumental role for the construction of what counts as a Muslim identity in Pakistan. And that's why that group has become particularly important. And why were they of such concern, given, as I understand it, they are a tiny proportion of the population? (laughs) This is surprising. Such a tiny, tiny group. It's 1%, is that correct? Less than 1%. And so the, the role is in constructing the identity of the country far exceeds their sort of numbers. And yet, as a symbolic point of reference, as a keystone for thinking about what the boundaries of the Islamic community might mean, um, their significance has become vastly increased. And so many cases concerning things like blasphemy will really uh, build on the statements and beliefs and practices of, of the Ahmadi community. In the 1980s, there was actually a revision of the, the blasphemy laws in Pakistan specifically targeting the Ahmadi community and saying that those who identify prophets after Muhammad uh, will so outrage the community uh, that that particular belief or statement should be prosecuted as a criminal matter, um, basically posing a risk of outrage and, as I indicated earlier, a public order risk. And so even the peaceful practices of the the Ahmadi, just simply believing what they believe and saying what they believe, um, became a criminal matter. Were they essentially considered to be the potential thin edge of the wedge? They were potentially seen as the thin edge of the wedge um, insofar as once this doctrinal difference could be accepted, what other doctrinal differences might be accepted as well? And slowly but surely, if so many different versions of what it means to be a Muslim can be uh, considered and legalized and accepted and so on, then perhaps the boundaries of the community itself would begin to become difficult to discern, difficult to identify, and the community's identity, in other words, its boundaries, would unravel, and that would be considered very risky for the state. What impact has that had on the Amity? Very serious impact. So I think it's useful to take just a second to talk about the blasphemy context in Pakistan, because there are, curiously, colonial laws concerning blasphemy that were derived from British laws concerning blasphemy, but then took shape in the Indian Penal Code uh, in the 19th century. Uh, And so if you look at the Indian Penal Code at, at sections 295 and 298, those are the sections that are about blasphemy. And then after the separation of India and Pakistan, if you will, Pakistan inherited the Indian Penal Code. So even today in the Pakistan Penal Code, you'll see sections 295 and 298 about blasphemy. Even in Bangladesh, which of course split from Pakistan, you will look at sections 295 and 298 concerning blasphemy. In fact, the reach of this code was so great that in Malaysia um, and then in Singapore, and for that matter, in, in Burma, if you look at uh, the penal code of each country, you'll see sections 295, 298, um, also concerning blasphemy. So this just gives an indication of the, again, the transnational reach of some of the colonial laws. What you see in these laws is, again, sort of the legacy of British ideas about blasphemy. As, as you may know, uh, the British laws concerning blasphemy protected Christianity in particular until 2008. Uh, when the blasphemy law was was finally removed from the British statute books. Well, in Pakistan, it wasn't until a bit later that the blasphemy law was then specified to protect uh, Islam in particular, 
while we might think that specifying a protection for Islam in particular could be specific to the Muslim majority Pakistani context, it is useful to remember that that these are derived from British blasphemy laws that protected Christianity in particular. But eventually in the 1980s, this protection for Islam in particular in the blasphemy elements of the penal code went one step further. And protecting Islam in particular took on a new meaning, which is to say, in order to protect Islam in particular, we need to address particular practices from the Ahmadis as blasphemous. Okay. And so when the Ahmadis would describe their faith, they were regarded as already articulating a form of blasphemy, um, which was seen as offending Islam in particular. That's why the blasphemy laws have become such an important part of the pattern of persecution for, for the Amadi community. So peaceful religious practice still regarded as very provocative and potentially a public order risk. Um, in fact, it is interesting that the blasphemy laws are really used to target people who call themselves Muslim in Pakistan, not necessarily Christians or Hindus or Sikhs or other groups. And so the, the Amadis are disproportionately, far disproportionately affected by that law. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's recently launched online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Ali Moore, and I'm joined by political scientist Dr. Matthew Nelson, who specialises in South Asia, and law researcher Dr. Deanne Shah, who focuses on the intersection of law and religion. Diane, we've just been talking there about the construction of the identity of a Muslim in a Pakistan context and, and the Amadi. Can we look a little bit about the, I suppose, the political landscape in Malaysia? Since independence, there have been two major parties that have essentially battled for the hearts and minds of Muslims in Malaysia. Can you tell us a little bit about them and whether or not their interpretations of what it means to profess Islam differ? Sure. I guess I'll start by saying that uh, just like in Pakistan, who counts as a Muslim in the context of Malaysia is an important issue. And it's important in the context of nation building, particularly with regard to the Malay Muslim community. And the Malays are the dominant ethnic group, about 70% of the population and the constitution defines Malays as persons who profess the religion of Islam. Of course, there's no specification officially or in the constitution or of what branch or, or school of Islam that is enforced. But traditionally, and it's understood that the mainstream doctrine is the Sunni school and more specifically of the Shafi mazhab or school of thought. Now, um, Ahmadis also exist in Malaysia. They have been at various points in time uh, prosecuted as heretics under state level Sharia laws. They have reported some cases of harassment by state religious authorities, for instance, to prevent them from conducting uh, religious events or worship. So if one were to visit the Ahmadiyya headquarters in the state of Selangor, uh, the authorities have actually erected this huge signboard outside their premises saying that the Ahmadiyya is not Islam and they are not Muslims. Now, going back to the political context uh, of this. Now, until 2018 or 2019, I'll explain in a moment why I say that. The two parties that have uh, fought or vied for Muslim, Malay Muslim support have been AMNO and PAS. Now, AMNO is a Malay nationalist party. PAS is an Islamic party who rose to become AMNO's main competitor for Malay votes, especially in the Malay heartlands, in the states of the Malay heartlands. So PAS has always campaigned, among others, on the premise that AMNO, or the AMNO-led government coalition at that time, they lacked the capacity and motivation to pursue 
the fundamental principles of Islam in governance. But past its emergence actually had its roots in Amno's political strategy itself. So Amno, we're talking about, you know, in the 1950s here. Amno at that time, they were conscious about the need to appeal to the Malay Muslim masses. And therefore, they sought to expand their Malay support base in the villages, in the rural areas, by attracting local religious leaders. And to do that, they created an Islamic camp of sorts within the party itself. However, the main characters in Amno, the main leaders, were of course of uh, uh, secular orientation. And eventually, the relations uh, between these competing uh, parties soon began to sour and some personalities broke away from Amno in 1951 to form PAS, which is the Islamic Party. Of course, it is a very different story now, uh, especially after 2019, because now both PAS and Amno have set up a coalition. They have worked together now, uh, which is called the Muafakat National or the National Consensus. And they are now part of the ruling coalition since February 2020. And are they united in their approach and their interpretation of the identity of what it is to be a Muslim? To the extent that a Muslim is, you know, a Sunni Muslim, Malay Muslim, yes, they are united in in that respect. You mentioned earlier, you talked about the the focus on public order. Can you talk a little more about the tools that the government and, and the political parties use for those that they consider to be provocateurs, if you like? Mm. So there are various tools that have been used. So the use of national security laws, such as the Internal Security Act. So there was a time in the 1980s, especially, and in the 1990s, when AMNO and PAS were really at the height of their rivalry. The government at that time used national security laws to detain political opposition or opponents, including PAS members or PAS politicians. At one point, there was the amendment and the use of the penal code. So the penal code at one point was amended to introduce section 298A. And this section criminalizes acts that cause or attempt to cause or are likely to cause disharmony or feelings of enmity on the grounds of religion, either between persons professing the same religion or between persons of different religions. Now, it's really interesting here because in the parliamentary debates, after the amendment was passed, the government actually admitted to some extent that the penal code was amended and this section was introduced to target anti-government propaganda delivered through uh, sermons and other forms of religious uh, propagation. So the context to this is that past back then was very notorious for using mosques and madrasas to advocate against supporting the government on the grounds that the government was not Islamic enough and that the personalities within the government were infidels. So that's uh, one other example. Uh, There are many other initiatives that the government in Malaysia has used. So there was an Islamization program Uh, especially from the 1980s onwards, to show that the government is committed to Islam. So that was one of the more policy-oriented initiatives to counter Pass's rhetoric that this is not a government that is fighting for Muslim interests. Uh, Of course, subsequently, the then Prime Minister Mahathir declared that Malaysia uh, is an Islamic state. So... Legal tools, they have been used by the government both at federal and state levels to control and restrict political rivals, uh, including by classifying them or touting them as heretics. Matthew, I know that we've been talking with you about Pakistan, but can we compare Indonesia at all here? Like Malaysia and Pakistan, it's a Muslim-majority country. It's not, of course, a a former British colony. It's a former Dutch colony. But uh, they do, Indonesia does have the Amadi and the Shia who identify as Muslims, but they're regarded as heretics by the mainstream. How does the Indonesian government deal with those communities? 
this is again a, a very interesting question because you know initially talking about Pakistan and Malaysia, we're talking about countries that to a certain extent, as, as we've discussed, have a British common law tradition. And then we turn to Indonesia, uh, a former Dutch colony where the civil law tradition is present. Uh, we also have Pakistan and Malaysia sort of referencing Islam as the the religion of the state. And, and then we turn to Indonesia, um, where that's not the case. And instead, there's this notion of Panchasila. And so both on the, if you will, the colonial background and on the, the reference to religion in law, um, you might think that the Pakistan and Malaysia experience might be very different from, from the Indonesian experience. And yet, what we find is that the actual legal process whereby debates about who counts as a Muslim, who counts as a heretic, and so on, end up sounding very similar. And, and the reason they sound similar is that in the penal laws, and in, even in the constitutional dimension, questions of public order are common across all three states. So for instance, if you look at a constitutional provision concerning religious freedom, it will say religious freedom is protected subject to public order or public health or public morality and so on. In Indonesia, you see very similar language. And so the, the tools that are used legally to address the provocation of people who are considered heretics or heterodox in one way or another, uh, the offense created by uh, their beliefs or their statements, those concerns about provocation and offense and public order are all finding their legal hook, again, in laws that say religious freedom is protected as a right subject to public order. And that's the same in Indonesia as it is in Pakistan and Malaysia. In fact, Dion mentioned in passing it earlier on that even when you look at international conventions of human rights, like the ICCPR on civil and political rights, again, you will see language that says religious freedom is protected subject to public order. And so while Pakistan and Indonesia have actually ratified the ICCPR, not Malaysia, you can again see a, a connection between what they say in their constitutions and an international human rights clause concerning religious freedom. And it's, it's that element of the religious freedom legal language, the public order element um, that has allowed for the Ahmadiyya in Indonesia and other groups to be prosecuted or sometimes persecuted on the basis of what would otherwise be regarded as peaceful religious practice, but still regarded as so provocative that it could create a public order problem and therefore falls foul of protection for that right. Mm. If I could chime in, uh, Ali, if you don't mind. So in Indonesia, there is a blasphemy law, and this is not a new law. This was enacted in 1965 by President Sukarno through a presidential decree. The law prohibits a person from publicly advocating or seeking support for a religious interpretation or religious activities that uh, deviate from the core doctrines of a religion. And this blasphemy law inspired Article 156A of the Indonesian Criminal Code. And if you recall the case of uh, the former Jakarta governor, Ahok, he was charged under this criminal code. And the justification behind this law was precisely what Matt mentioned, to safeguard public order, national unity and religious harmony. And I, I want to explore the sort of broader ramifications of that uh, as we near the end of our podcast, but I, I need to return, Deanne, to this issue of religious conversion. So what happens when someone no longer wishes to identify as Muslim? If someone wants to officially change their religion, as has happened in Malaysia? The short answer to that, Ali, is it depends on which state you find yourself in, <laughs> in Malaysia. So because Islam is regulated at the state levels, there are various procedures regulating how a Muslim would want to leave his or her religion. So there are some states where there are punitive measures involved, like if you renounce Islam, you would be jailed, for instance, there is a state where the procedure is more permissive. Uh, and that is the state of Negri Sembilan, where you can apply to the religious authorities telling them you want to renounce Islam. And they will make you go through like a program. They call it rehabilitation <laughs> in some ways, essentially to assess 
if you are still comfortable with the religion what is it that you are not satisfied with the religion and after going through that procedure for one year or this rehabilitation process if you still decide at the end of that you want to leave the religion then you can do so but that is only in one state in the state of Negeri Sembilan so what happened with the case of Lena Joy where was she Lena Joy, unfortunately, uh, her case emerged in the federal territories. And the federal territories, in the context of the Malaysian constitutional arrangement, is governed by the federal legislature. Now, what happened here was that she had converted to Christianity. She was baptized in the religion. And so she wanted to remove the word Islam as her official religious identification from her national identity card. and. The federal court essentially said that if you want to remove this word Islam from your national identity card, essentially if you want to change your religion, then you have to go through the Sharia court's procedures to do so. The federal court did not say that she didn't have freedom of religion or that she absolutely cannot change her religion, but it's just that she needed to go through the Sharia court procedures to do so. Now, the problem was that in the federal territories, law, there was simply no procedures spelled out governing how a Muslim could renounce Islam. So in the end, where did Lena end up? In the end, she did not avail herself to the Sharia courts. I think she found that it would be futile. Uh, So she left the country. That was the last information that I received. So do you, Diane, do you see the ability to change religion at the heart of religious freedom? And and to what extent does this particular case show that that ability to self-identify is in the end inextricably linked to government interpretation? That's a very good question, Ali. Yes. Um, for me personally, the ability to change your religion or to choose one's religion lies at the heart of one's freedom of religion. That is the forum internum aspect of freedom of religion, the freedom to believe. In the context of Malaysia, there is a whole multitude of other factors that are involved here. And one is mentioned by Matt earlier, the idea of public order. So one of the reasons why the federal court in Lina Joy decided that she had to go through the Sharia court procedures was this concern. And this was a concern that was also expressed by the government that if a person was allowed to freely enter or leave a particular religion, in this case Islam, then it would destabilize the Muslim community. In the court's specific words, it would cause chaos to the Muslim community. And of course, the identification of a person as a Muslim is important because, as you know, it's identified in the national identity card uh, and therefore it has a lot of implications on the status of this person in terms of what he or she cannot do. Will he or she now be subjected to Islamic laws or not? You know, as long as you have the word Islam on your identity card, you will be identified as a Muslim and therefore you are subjected to Islamic laws in matters such as personal laws, family, marriage, divorce and so on. So Diane, do you believe there is freedom of religion in Malaysia? Yes, I do believe that there is freedom of religion in Malaysia. However, there are limitations. And the question that we are, of course, faced with in Malaysia, and this is a perennial question, and this is a continuing issue, is to what extent can those limits be justified? So limits can be understandable, for instance, to protect uh, public order. But if it goes too far, then that would be problematic. Now, the conception of public order in Malaysia, as it has been used, is that it has this preventative or preemptive notion attached to it. Uh, In other words, there is a tendency to use public order justification to prevent public disorder, or uh, if you view it in another way, to placate concerns of certain sections of the community who might feel offended or uneasy with the existence or the activities of 
religious minorities or with religious conversions. And these feelings may stem from the perception and belief that the minorities could be heretics, that they could be tarnishing the sanctity of a particular religion. If you renounce Islam, if you leave Islam, you are tarnishing the integrity and the sanctity of Islam itself. And that if you convert to another religion or if you profess another religion, then you might be out to spread your beliefs to others. And there is a lot of anxiety about that. Matthew, I guess, uh, I mean, indeed, both you and Diane have written in a, a joint academic writing that essentially the question is, at what point do administrative regulations render one's right to religious freedom meaningless, as Diane was just very clearly explaining those tensions there? Your thoughts on where that tension leaves the basic right of religious freedom? I think that the first thing people frequently overlook is that when we think about fundamental rights, uh, most of the fundamental rights that we're familiar with, free speech or freedom of religion or freedom of mobility and and so on, those rights in law always come with a qualifier, uh, which is that the right is protected subject to public order, public health, and sometimes public morality and so on. And so the idea of a fundamental right being uh, guaranteed and unlimited is a little bit of a misconception. And so the questions that Dion and I have written about and that I think you're, you're touching on is if there will be limits, how do we think about those limits with reference to religious freedom? And one of the things we've tried to point out is that when there's going to be a limit, it has to be justifiable and widely accepted. It has to be understood as legitimate, Okay. And that legitimacy is sometimes considered only with reference to majority communities and not with reference to minority communities or people who are moving between communities, for instance, through conversion and so on. And so when we talk about whether a limit on a fundamental right is justified or legitimated and so on, I think that we need to think about that very carefully. It's not just about asking majorities whether they think that the minority should have their rights limited. Um, it's about whether there is a broad-based sense uh, that whatever limit we're thinking about is, is understandable and justifiable and legitimate. Uh, so even today, when we're in the context of a global pandemic, I think it's a useful moment to think about some of these issues. There are limits on our rights, for instance, with reference to lockdowns. And we have some people who think that those limitations on, for instance, your fundamental right to mobility are justified and that people should be locked down um, and that that is legitimate in order to protect the nation, in order to protect public health. Um, And other people disagree. Other people think that these lockdowns and these restrictions, these limits on our fundamental rights, which are introduced to protect the nation, protect against a public health risk, that those have gone too far. Uh, And I think what we're saying with reference to these limits on fundamental rights, whether it's a fundamental right of religious freedom or a fundamental right um, of mobility, is that those limits have to be examined uh, and they have to be considered by broad sections of the public, uh, not just majoritarian, um, but also with reference to minorities and, and individuals on the margins. And so when it, when it comes to fundamental rights of religious freedom, I think that they, they do exist. And I think that they are occasionally limited. And I think that those limits are occasionally justified. Um, but I think what we're really trying to highlight in some of our work is the importance of keeping those, those limits under review. Deanne makes the point that it is a perennial question, the extent to which the limits are justified. It's not something that at a point in time you can decide. It is a, a perennial issue that must be constantly re-examined. Exactly. There's no universal law of the limit. <laughs> there is only a sort of the political circumstances that let you consider what the limit should be. We sometimes think of a, of a fundamental right being related to a universal transhistorical right um, that is just fixed in time for all places. But when we think about those secondary clauses about public order, we have to realize that even those rights and then their limits are related to particular circumstances. And I think that's really important to keep in mind, even in the context of, of Islamic thought, uh, when it comes to religious freedom, there is this notion that there should be no compulsion in religion. Uh, that religion should be a matter of, you know, 
personal reflection, personal uh, belief, and personal, as Dion said, choice. And there's extensive debate about how to protect that right while also protecting the larger community. So on the one hand, the individual's right to believe. On the other hand, uh, the risk that the community as a whole could be under threat if, if all kinds of people are doing all kinds of different things. And, and there's a sense of, of having to, to look at that very carefully and that ultimately one's belief is a matter for an individual and God, but that in the community, uh, there are also uh, considerations about how the community can hold itself together. Well, Deanne, I know that you're in Singapore. Matthew and I are recording this podcast in Melbourne, where we are in hard lockdown at the moment as we speak. So we very much understand the tension between public order and uh, public health and freedoms. But as you both say, it's one of those issues that needs to be constantly revisited. An enormous thank you to both of you for joining Ear to Asia. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us, Ali. Our guests have been South Asia political scientist Dr. Matthew Nelson from Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne and Malaysia law specialist Dr. Deanne Shah from the National University of Singapore's Law School. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or SoundCloud. If you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And of course, let your friends know about us on social media. This episode was recorded on the 25th of September, 2020. Producers were Calvin Parham and Eric Van Bemmel of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2020, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company. <laughs>